is so warm in here. <laughs> it is so hot. This is technically a sunroom, so I am baking in here right now. And I do have an AC unit in the window, but I don't want to use it because then it's, it's going to be so loud. And I'm afraid it's just going to completely mar the sound in here. So I, I'm just going to sit and stew. Welcome. Welcome to a summer in Chicago. It is humid and I hate it. <laughs> Unpopular opinion, I don't really like summer. I think once you become an adult and there's the fun of summer break is gone and you just have to continue to work, at least if you're an American, I, it's not fun anymore. You're hot, you're sweaty, I get irritated when I'm hot, so it's just not a good time. I much prefer the fall and I actually kind of prefer the winter, so... But the good thing is that Chicago comes alive, there's tons of stuff to do, so that part is really fun. But I'm st I'm hot and I'm bothered. <laughs> but it's a good day today because I'm going over a book haul. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Catherine, this is a very new channel and you really keep buying books. Like, this may be like the third time we've seen a huge stack of books in the thumbnail. And I'm like, look, I get it. I get it. I get it, but I can't be stopped. And also a lot of these books, if they weren't free, because they were in little free libraries, or if they weren't super cheap, like a dollar, two dollars at the thrift store, there's a couple that are new books. I think I have, well, I have four that are brand new books, one of which was a gift. So cost-wise, this isn't breaking the bank for me. However, my apartment's starting to get a little bit overrun with books and I buy them faster than I read them. But I don't care, okay? I don't care, because I love them. <laughs> Some of these are books I've been wanting to get my hands on for a while, so I'm so happy to show them here. I have too many to like hold up. I think I might try to hold them up at the end. If I'm brave, if I'm strong, if I find the strength within, I will hold them all up. But I, uh, there, there's a lot here. But I'm excited, I'm excited. Let's begin. First off, if there are any yard sales in your area, go check them out. Just, just go take a peek, take a little gander, to get a little iced coffee, if you will, and just go and walk and like find your little local yard sales, because you find gems. You find absolute gems by rummaging through your neighbor's stuff. <laughs> and this includes books. I just happened to be walking to get a coffee and there was a guy in a gorilla mask with a sign that said, yard sale this way. And I went, that's how you kidnap me. So I <laughs> went down that way, did not get kidnapped. It was lovely people selling their things when they were about to move. And they had a whole table of books and I was amped because I got three books. Ta -da -da! So the first one is by Arthur, I'm totally gonna butcher this name. Arthur Kostler? Kostler? I'm gonna say Arthur Kostler, Darkness at Noon. This is a political novel. Darkness at Noon stands as an unequaled fictional portrayal of the nightmarish politics of our time. Its hero is an aging revolutionary imprisoned and psychologically tortured by the party to which he has dedicated his life. As the pressure to confess preposterous crimes increases, he relives a career that embodies the terrible ironies and human betrayals of a totalitarian movement, masking itself as an instrument of deliverance. I like a political novel every so often. Uh, love a good 1984, love one where it's someone who's kind of going up against a bad regime. Uh, and so this has been on my radar for a while. I can say this is the book that I'm like, I was so excited to get my hands on this, but very, I'm very interested in this book and I've heard good things about it. She charged me, I think like a dollar per book, which for some of the books coming up, it, that's actually insane that she did. Uh, so this was, this was a dollar and we love, we love to see that. Darkness at Noon. Next is a Charlotte Bronte. I got Shirley. Uh, so this is one of her lesser known novels. Jane Eyre obviously being one of the uh, most well-known and also, which I have right here with me, Valette being very well-known, but Shirley is not as well-known. Written immediately after Jane Eyre, Shirley is a novel of wider sweep and scope. Its focus is less on individual men and women, although their stories add compulsive drama and tension, than on the individual perceived in close relation with the forces of molding society. Charlotte Bronte chose to set it during the Napoleonic Wars, war and peace, everybody, a period of bad harvests, Luddite riots, economic unrest, and the oppression of women in order to grapple with social and political issues. In her story of two contrasting heroines and the men they love, can be traced her wish to reconcile the world of romantic love and fulfillment with the gritty realities of suffering, obligation, and social duty. So fun. I do love a good English novel that delves into English society. And during the Napoleonic Wars, I forgot that this is technically a historical fiction novel. How fun. But I don't think I will get to this super soon because I'm going to read another historical fiction novel about the Napoleonic Wars, aka War and Peace. I'm starting that next month. So I think I will not read this right away, but it's there. It's there for me. And she was a dollar. 
Thank you, yard sale people. This was a single dollar. And it's in great condition. It's one of these old Black Spine Penguin classics. Super cool. Surely, surely you can't be serious. The next is absolutely crazy that I got this for a dollar. I got this for a dollar at that same yard sale. It's a first edition copy of Christine by Stephen King. This isn't even a Stephen King that I have been super amped to read, but I saw this one there and I was looking at it and I was like, this looks like the cover design and like the feeling of the cover. I was like, this feels old to me. This feels like it could be a first edition. And sure enough, looking in the, also like title page looks so cool. Going in here, it's like, yep, copyright 1983 with no other publication information which is telling me this is this is a first edition which is really cool and i got it for a dollar baby also i love the back it says stephen king and a friend <laughs> like okay stephen so uh, this isn't even one that i really was focused on picking up or wanting but i saw it and i was like it's a first edition and it's a sick cover i feel like i just will, i will read it eventually and i i'm glad i have it so this was this was a good find. She was partying with a lot of Stephen King and I, a lot of them were also ones that I wasn't super interested in, but this is definitely the coolest edition. And it was a dollar and I was like, why not? Because then if I hate it, I can just give it to my yard sale or put it in a little free library. I won't sell it because I'm not a reseller, but I could. <laughs> I probably could maybe make a little money off this, but I don't think I will do that because I believe in giving people books for free. Uh, if you don't know the story, this is about a car that kills people, which is why the back is so haha -ha funny. I'm here for it. <laughs> sure. So those are all the books I got at that yard sale. It was very fruitful. Uh, the next is, I would say, we'll go into books that I found in Little Free Libraries. My Little Free Libraries in this crunchy, left-leaning neighborhood <laughs> do not disappoint. They always deliver. I always find books in here. And I'd say probably my neighbors think so too, because that's where I put all of the books that I don't want anymore. And me being, having insanely good taste. Uh, that means this whole neighborhood is pretty well read. <laughs> but I always find really good books. So I have a couple that are near me. I can think of four right now that are all within like five minutes walking distance. Because people just in this neighborhood just love them. I'm here for it. I'm here. Uh, pff, yeah. You want to give away your books? Absolutely. But the one that's on my street specifically is so good. Like there's always something in there and it has blessed me time and time again. And I try to match the karma and, and put stuff back in it. <laughs> Not all these are from the same little free library, but this is, the, this is category of, I found this in a little free library. Uh, starting with one that was on my street. Uh, it is... The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Mirakami. I picked this up when I was on my way to yoga, so I like had only a yoga bag with me, and I found this and I was like, well, I gotta take it. And I was like fitting it in my yoga bag, which was difficult because that bag takes up a lot of room. I actually do not know much about this book at all. Just that it's like, I would say of Mirakami's works, this is probably one of his most well-known. In a Tokyo suburb, a young man named Toru Okada searches for his wife's missing cat. That much I know. Like that I kind of knew was like the starting, the premise. Soon he finds himself looking for his wife as well in a netherworld that lies beyond the placid surface of Tokyo. As these searches intersect, Okada encounters a bizarre group of allies and antagonists. A psychic prostitute, a malevolent yet mediagenic politician, a cheerfully morbid 16 year old girl, and an aging war veteran who has been permanently changed by the hideous things he witnessed during Japan's forgotten campaign in Manchuria. Okay. The cover intrigues me because obviously it has a bird on it, Wind Up Bird Chronicle, but there's this like big hole that kind of has like a little bit, it's a little indented right here. So I thought it might have been one of those cupboards that you can like peel it off and there'd be stuff inside, but there's nothing. Just a little indented circle. So I am, I'm intrigued. The only Mirakami I've ever read is Norwegian Wood and I quite liked it. I can't say that I was obsessed, but I really liked it. So I'm just going to keep reading them. I have this one and I have Kafka on the Shore. And I have his like kind of memoir, I guess you can kind of consider it a memoir, um, when I talk about when I talk about running. I am acquiring a lot of Mirakami. I am not prioritizing a lot of Mirakami. But we'll get to him. We'll get to him. Next that I got in a little free library, not in my main one, but one that was on my way to the train. A uh, Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. I've heard great stuff about this. This is technically science fiction. This is basically a world where there's been robots and robots kind of 
they gain self-awareness and then they kind of go off and make their own society and then they disappear. So like these robot, there's these robots, they kind of take over, they kind of gain their own consciousness and then they go and disappear. One day the life of a tea monk is upended by the arrival of a robot. So it's like it's they're getting reintroduced and they're realizing that they had this like the robots have this own world. I'm not explaining this well at all. It's very short. Like I, I think I could just pick this up and read this in a couple days. I have heard great stuff about this book that it's like very nice science fiction. It's not super hard science fiction. That it's just a lovely story. So I was like, you know what? Why not? It's literally in this little free library. It's in perfect condition. It's so weird. Someone wrote in the title page Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a book that I have. And I'm so interested to see why they put that in there. Maybe they, these two are kind of related in, in themes. That's so interesting. Some of them I've talked on this channel before, because I completely ripped off one of her ideas for one of my videos, is Ariel Bissett. She has talked about this book and she really likes it. So that's what kind of got me interested. I don't know why, maybe the cover, maybe just like the premise of it. I thought it was going to be more YA. It's not. It's an adult book. If it was why I wouldn't necessarily turn my nose away from it, but I was kind of pleasantly <laughs> surprised to find that it was a adult book because that's it's mostly what I read is adult fiction. So excited, excited for this. I think it's going to be good. It'd be a cozier read than I'm usually drawn to. So it's also just a great name, A Psalm for the Wild Bill. Like what a great title. So that's that one. Next is one that I like was interested in, but heard mixed things about. It's Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle. She big. She kind of she kind of thick. This won the Man Booker Prize in 2009. It's historical fiction, but I know it's based on a lot of research. This is about the rise to power and the power grab of Thomas Cromwell, who was an advisor in uh, Henry VIII's court with the Tudors. And yeah, Thomas Cromwell kind of like, yeah, I'm here to help. And then he just slowly kind of sinks his teeth in and, and gains power, which is historically what happened, but this is kind of like a fictionalized telling of, of that. I've heard great things, like a, this is like seen as like great historical fiction and seen as like a definer of the genre. And then there's some people who are like, I do not understand why this won a Man Booker Prize, this book's shit, like some people on Goodreads really trash it, <laughs> really, really trash it. But when a book is like that, I'm very intrigued. Like I kind of want to lean in and see why that is. And sometimes it's just the case of some people just like, it just didn't click with them. And for some people, it, they just didn't see the brilliance of it. it. It could be anything. So that always intrigues me. And again, I got this at a little free library. My coffee shop has a little free library in the coffee shop. This is, is why I patronize them. Because uh, <laughs> then I get books sometimes. I picked it up and I like went to go get my coffee and I like, had it in my hand. And the barista was so nice. The barista was like, oh my God, what are you reading? And I'm like, oh, I'm not reading it yet. <laughs> but I just like picked it up in your little free library and I explained it and he was like, that sounds cool. That sounds really cool. And I'm like, it does sound really cool. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, I'm gonna have to read it and then tell that barista what I thought of it. So we'll fall. This book, I was so excited to find this in the Little Free Library. Was not expecting to find this in the Little Free Library, but it delivered. I found it in the same one that Psalm of the Wild built uh, was in, which I'm like, that means someone in this neighborhood has wants to talk about books <laughs> or maybe didn't like them because that's why they unhauled them. The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida by Shehan Karun Atilaka. Atilaka. Karun Atikala. I think I said that right. So this won the Man Booker Prize in 2022. Uh, Prophet Song by Paul, I forget his last name, won 2023. This is the one that won in 2022. The Booker Prize is one that I kind of follow. If you go on their website, there's like so many cool listicles and articles on there. I recommend going to the Booker Prize website. You can also like read about the judges who are just all really interesting people. And you could read about, of course, the long list and the shortlisted folks. So this one in 2022, this is a writer from Sri Lanka. I have never read anything from Sri Lanka. I've read a good amount of Indian literature, but nothing from Sri Lanka. Just the idea of this it sounds extremely like magical realism, almost blending into fantasy, but it sounds fantastic. Colombo, 1990. Molly Almeida, war photographer, gambler, and closet queen, who has woken up dead in what seemed like a celestial visa office. His dismembered body is sinking into the serene Barra Lake, and he has no idea who killed him. In a country where scores are settled by death squads, suicide bombers, and hired goons, the list of suspects is depressingly long, as the ghouls and ghosts with grudges who cluster around can attest. But even in the afterlife, time is running out for Molly. 
He has seven moons to contact the man and woman he loves most and lead them to the photos that will rock Sri Lanka. A rip-roaring State of the Nation epic from one of Sri Lanka's foremost authors, The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida is a thrilling read that offers equal parts of mordant wit and disturbing profound truths. That just sounds so cool to me. Like that sounds really, really fun. The cover is amazing, by the way. And I just, I, that sounds so fascinating to me. It sounds almost like, like it kind of reminds me of Salman Rushdie. And I don't just say that because he's an Indian author. Uh, it, it sounds like kind of like a Midnight's Children kind of thing. Sounds like a little bit, almost like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, like leaning into that. I don't know this man's writing style at all. I do not know this author at all. So it could be completely different from that, but the concept just sounds fascinating to me. And so I've been wanting to get my hands on this, but it was like, oh, it's like a brand, almost a brand new book. Like I'm gonna have to buy it new or buy it used. And so when I found this in a little free library, I was like, let's go. <laughs> this is why I give to the little free libraries because then the universe gives back to me, so excited for this one. I am actually, I'm really excited for this. Next was also a generous gift because this also would be, uh, you could buy it used and probably not get it for that much, but if you bought it new it would be quite hefty. It is a hardcover copy of 112263 by Stephen King. <laughs> Another Stephen King. Uh, but I mean, come on. Yeah, baby! It's literally hardcover. It's in great condition. I bet you someone picked this up and was like, I can't keep going and just put it in there. I was so happy to find this. Talk about a book that I was like on my way to something. I'm like, I'm gonna have to just take it. Take it with me. For those of you that don't know this book, this is one of Stephen King's later works. I think this came out in, I'm gonna say the 2010s. Yeah, 2011. This is about uh, a man, a young man who goes back in time. He finds out he like can time travel. And so he goes back in time to try to save JFK from getting assassinated on you know, the date, 11 63 I'm fascinated by this book. A friend of mine, when we were working at an internship, was reading this while we were there, and she really liked it. Like, she was really into it. So uh, since then, that's when I put it on my, on my TBR, and that's when it was on my radar. Oh, I'm just realizing the back. I'm just seeing the back. The back is what looks like an old newspaper, and the date at the top says Saturday, November 23rd, 1963, and it says JFK escapes assassination. First lady also okay. <laughs> and I'm reading that, I'm like, he didn't make it out. And then I'm like, oh, that's like, that's what the book is hoping to do. Never saw that, that's actually kind of hilarious. So I've, I've been wanting to get my hands on this. However, again, this is not the Stephen King that I'm planning to read. I'm planning to read The Stand later this year. I have like a full unabridged copy of it that I'm planning to read. I think around like September, October. So again, I'm gonna keep this in my library. I won't get to this one right away. I have The Stand, I also have It, and now I also have Christine. So every year I do <clears throat> the obligatory Stephen King read, which means I read one per year because otherwise he's gonna oversaturate the market. I take, I take one per year. The next, I'll, I'll go into the books that I bought new. I do not often buy new books. I try to find them in little free libraries or try to buy them used. However, sometimes I just happen to wander into the beautifully curated bookstores that these cities I visit have, and they happen to have books that I really want or that I haven't been able to find, or I just want to, when I go to a little bookstore, I want to buy a book from them so I can keep them in business because we cannot buy our books from Amazon that I don't do, except for my Lord of the Rings trilogy because it was pretty inexpensive. But other than that, other than the Lord of the Rings set, I do not ever usually buy books from Amazon. I like to patronize the smaller stores. I was in New York for like less than 24 hours. Like I was in there really quick um, before going, where the hell was I going? Why was I in New York? I don't remember, but I was in New York basically for like 24 hours and I was with my siblings and I went into this bookstore called McNally Jackson, which is also one that Ariel Bissett has brought up before. There's two locations. There's one in Brooklyn. I went to the one on the Lower East Side and I was obsessed with this bookstore. It was gorgeous, beautifully curated. When I'm talking that they didn't just have like a fiction section, they had like American fiction, French fiction, British fiction, queer fiction. Like they had everything just like 
beautifully broken up. They had so many books. Unfortunately, we had to catch a boat home to New Jersey. So I did not have time, like the proper time to go into this bookstore. But when I go back to New York, you better believe right now, I'm taking you with me and we're going in there and we're spending quality time. So I basically, we get there. The first floor of this bookstore was a lot of um, like new releases. And for a minute I was kind of like, is this all, I, is this it? Like, cause this is nice. It was gorgeous. It's like wood paneled. The decor in there was perfection. I'm like, this is gorgeous, but these are all, you know, new releases. We then realized we're like, oh, there's an upstairs. <laughs> Duh. So that's when we went upstairs and I went, oh, this is where everything is. Like there was just books galore. But my sister was like, um, we only have like, like 15 minutes. And I was like, I know, let me cook. And so I just like went through these aisles so quickly. The tables they set up with like the staff picks. I love, I love when you go to a bookstore and they just have that like center table of books for you to pick up. Pick up. Those were beautifully curated. And my eye just kind of went like to a table of books about like the book, like the table was called like difficult women or like difficult, crazy women. And I was like, that's my table. That's my brand. So I went over there and I just like took a cursory glance and they had stuff that I had been looking for, but also stuff that I was like, yeah, I could probably find that new or find that used. And then my eye caught one book and I went, you, <laughs> cause this is a book I never find. I can never find it in used bookstores. Uh, if you try to find it online, sometimes they don't have enough editions and they sell it for something crazy. Like it's this book is $60 and I'm like, no, it's freaking not. So this time I saw it and I was like, I have never seen even a new bookstore, like a, a bookstore that carries new books ever carry this book. So I 100% had to get it. It's I Await the Devil's Coming by Mary McLean. I was so excited to see this book. It was in print and then it went out of print for a while. And now I think it's it's back. And this is the only bookstore I ever saw that carried it. So I went, I have to get this book. This is a memoir, actually. It's about a young woman at the turn of the century. It's like 1902. She has to move to Butte, Montana, which God, <laughs> it, it, there was nothing out there, especially, th especially then. And she is like, I hate it here. I hate it here and I'm, I'm not happy about it. But she's not one of those women that's like, I will just grit and bear it and I'll be okay. And I have to do what my husband wants. She is like very vocal in this memoir. Of, she literally calls herself a difficult woman. She was like, I am a witch. I am, I am a, a spirit. She was like this woman who was so larger than life and just did not want to be confined to the roles of a housewife and being confined to the roles of women at the time. And she, and she like makes that very clear in this memoir. And she, you, she's just a woman that has so much life in her. And so when this memoir came out, because that title, I Await the Devil's Coming is kick ass. The fact she put that in there in 1902 is mind blowing. I saw this and I, I literally saw it because it has the same cover that I've seen for this book. I went, oh my God. I was like, I cannot believe they have this. The edition is the Never Sink Library. I don't really know that publisher at all. Mary McLean was a self-proclaimed genius. Yeah, self-proclaimed genius, a caged free spirit and a teenage girl made miserable by having to live in remote Butte, Montana in 1902. But when she published this book, she would break out of her cage, ushering in the era of the confessional memoir. It caused a sensation selling 100,000 copies in its first month alone and made her a star. Yes, queen. Yes, queen. So I really want to read this. Like I really want to pick this up and I really want to read it. Not usually buying used like new books. I was, I I had to make the exception here because I just have, I don't ever see this book. <laughs> it was so, so this actually would be a good one to suggest for my book club, Women in Classics. This would actually be a good one, but maybe it might be hard to get a copy of this. I don't know, but this next, this next one actually isn't from a new bookstore. So it actually really shouldn't be in this category, but I'm including it in here anyway, because I got it that same time I got that I Await the Devil's Coming book, uh, the same little trip to New York. There was a bookstore in the Lower East Side of New York called Sweet Pickle Books, which I've been wanting to visit for so long because I'd heard so much about it. And my sister had been there before and she was like, you, this is so up your alley, like you should go. So I went with her. It's this little teeny tiny little used bookstore in the Lower East Side where they sell used books and they sell pickles. Like what better place in the world? <laughs> I love books and I love pickles. We were texting my mom. We're like, we're in Sweet Pickle Books. Like, oh, and my mom was like, pick up some pickles for the weekend. We're like, pick up some pickles. Like, 
<laughs> okay? We didn't get any pickles, unfortunately. But I did want to get at least one book to, again, be able to patronize the place and get the bookmark, which is really cute. I don't have it with me right now, but I had to get the bookmark. I got The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg. Uh, it's in one of these English library, Penguin English Library copies, which I don't have anything in these editions, and I love these editions. I think they're really beautiful. They've got like the multicolored spines, so if you put them all together, they look really like colorful and beautiful. And they almost are like a, like a friendlier, more paperback, more like usable editions of the cloth bounds because they have the same kind of like repeated motif. I really like these. A Nightmarish Tale of Religious Fanaticism and Darkness this chilling classic of the macabre tells the tale of Robert Ringham, drawn in his moral confusion into committing the most monstrous acts by an evil doppelganger. That's <laughs> of course what I want to read. Uh, this is 18th century literature, so we're in the 1700s here. It's Scottish. Love that. The thought of, of like your evil doppelgangers making you do things, like sign me up. That sounds so, that sounds so interesting. I remember sh I showed this to my sister and I was like, this is what I'm getting. And she was like, Okay. I think this was, what, seven bucks? I was 14. Okay, that's fine. I was like, you know what, if it's supporting this bookstore, we're also in New York where the prices are just unbelievably astronomical, that I'm like, you know what, it's fine. I'm excited to read this. I am really excited. It sounds heavy metal. It sounds great. And also, I didn't even realize they stamped the book. It says Sweet Pickle Books. Yes. Very cool. Very, very cool. Love. The next two I got at a bookstore in Chicago. Uh, I was going to a rehearsal for something that happened to be in the same building as this bookstore. It's on the second floor of the Fine Arts Building uh, on Michigan Avenue. So if you're in Chicago and you are on Michigan Ave and you're like going to the Art Institute, whatever, please stop by the Fine Arts Building and go to Exile in Bookville. Great store. Great store. When I'm talking about like fantastic curation, insane selection, the editions they had here, I was like, I never see these editions in real life. Like, I never see any store stock these. I even said, when I was checking out, I said to the guy, I was like, you have great, like, you have great editions of things. I'm like, so happy to see the McNally editions here. I'm so happy to see the arc. I can never say that word, but I'll put it here. This, these editions, you have so many New York review books. I'm like, I have, there's so many here. And he was like, thank you. He's like, no one ever says that. Thank you. I'm like, I... I appreciate it. So I had to get two books when I was there. They are new, but I, so worth it in my opinion. I also just want to give a shout out to their bookmark. Exile in Bookville is obviously a reference to Exile in Guyville, a fantastic album by Liz Fair, if you've never listened. I saw Liz Fair last year in concert and she was so good. And it was the whole Exile in Guyville tour. So she did the whole album. Amazing. So obviously it's in reference to that. So the bookmark looks like a concert ticket. Like, if that's not attention to detail and, like, great branding, I don't know what is. I think that's fan-frickin-tastic. Exile? It's a stub! It's a ticket stub! As a music person and a book person, this just... This is it. This is it. I'm using this for every book. <laughs> Couldn't get too many books because I don't want to spend too much on brand new books because they do be pricey, but it, I, it do be worth it. So the first one I picked up was The Pure and the Impure by Colette. This is a book that got chosen for my book club, the book club that unfortunately I have not been able to go to for months now because of so many things that have been popping up on Monday nights. But this is an upcoming book and I know for sure I'm going to this meeting. So Colette is a famous French writer. She's known for, I forget the name of them. She's known for like a, a particular series of books that I remember in French class, like we were starting to read and like starting to get into. I remember being like, I don't really know what's going on because I wasn't that good at French. This is a novel. It's like a semi-autobiographical novel about her life. Colette considered The Pure and Pure her best book, the nearest I shall ever come to writing an autobiography. This guided tour of the erotic netherworld with which Colette was so intimately acquainted begins in the darkness and languor of a fashionable opium den and continues in a series of unforgettable encounters with men and, especially, women, whose lives have been improbably and yet permanently transfigured by the power of desire. Oh, happy pride. This is just about her doing opium and doing things in opium dens. And uh, yeah, obviously I want to read that. And I was so glad this got picked during the selection meeting because I was like, yeah, that one sounds, that one sounds juicy and sounds good. They had so many of these New York Review of Books classics, which these are always bangers. If you see this kind of cover, you know you're in for a banger. They had so many of these that I was like, you know what, why don't I pick up one that's for my book club? Because I 
might not be able to find it elsewhere, and they had it. So they also had, which just jumped out at me, and I went, I have to get this book. It's Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fenu, edited by Carmen Maria Machado. I was like, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know this was here. Hallelujah. Let's, let's bring it home. Let's do it. I was so happy to find this. I've been wanting to pick up Carmilla for a really long time. This is considered like the OG vampire story. This predates Dracula, Bram Stoker. I don't know if he ripped it off, but he definitely was not the original vampire writer. It's, it's Jay Sheridan Le Fenu. And this is about lesbian vampires. Car Carmilla basically like lures in a young woman to her. Need I say more? Like literally need I say more? There's also illustrate. There's illustrations in here. Ah, yes! <laughs> Happy Pride! Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, I'm so excited. Also the cover has like all of these anatomical drawings of bats, like the blood. And it's edited by Carmen Maria Machado, who I just read in the dream house and I loved. So now I'm like, anything she's written, anything she's had her hands on, I want. So for a bit I was like, well, I know I could get Carmilla, I know I could get it cheaper, but then I was like, no, I have to get it with Carmen Marie Machado and with the illustrations. It's too good. Oh, oh, sapphic vampires. Exile in Bookville in Chicago. Go check them out. They had fantastic books. Ah, bookmark. Can't lose it. Also a new book that I got, but this was a gift. This was a gift from my boyfriend's mother, Tina. Tina, if you're watching, thank you. Uh, she recently read this with a book group and she was speaking so highly of it. And I was like, this is a book that I've wanted to read for a while. I just like haven't picked it up and haven't gotten to it. But then she gifted it to me, which was so nice. Mexican Gothic by Sil Silvia Moreno Garcia. I've been like so curious about this book. I know I am late to this bandwagon. I know I am like, leagues beyond when this was super popular, but doesn't matter. I can get to it whenever I want. <laughs> this is basically what it says. It's a Mexican Gothic. It's about this woman who has to go, I believe it's to her brother's house. After receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin, Noemi Tobada heads to High Place, a distant house in the Mexican countryside unsure what she will find. So in classic, classic Gothic fashion, she's like summoned to a house and she has to like figure out the mysteries of it and has to grapple with the mysteries of it. And we love a gothic already. I love a gothic novel. But the fact that this is a contemporary one and it's set in Mexico, I'm like, this sign me up. That sounds, that sounds amazing. And so I've been very curious about this book for a long time. And then the fact Steve's mom just got it for me. I'm like, that is so, so nice. So I'm very happy to have this one. Again, it's, she's brand new. She's gorgeous. She's hardcover. I'm like, I can't ask for more. So very happy to get this book. Very, very happy. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. These are books that I got at my Village Discount Outlet. If you know, if you're in Chicago, you know. Thank you for shopping the Village. I basically live there. I, I love thrifting. I don't go that often. But when I am in there, I always go check the book section because amongst all of the Amish literature and all of the cookbooks and all of the Fifty Shades of Grey editions that people left behind, people leave behind some juicy gems. Like people leave behind the stuff and I'm like, why would you get rid of this book? I got a very nice Penguin Classics copy of Dostoevsky's House of the Dead. So this is an semi or pretty much autobiographical novel by Dostoevsky and about his time in a Siberian work camp. It was fun, so fun. No, it was, um, it was a really terrible time. And so to cope with it, and I think to write about his experience, he writes about it in the third person, writes about it that this character's going through it, but it's to highlight just how horrible the conditions in these work camps were. So this is by no means a, a fun time book, but just to add to my Dostoevsky collection, because love, love is writing. I've read The Brothers Karamazov, and then I've just been like slowly amassing his other books because I want to be able to read all of them someday. So House of the Dead is, is one of those. This is a very nice, I really like this copy of it. Me. And then the next I got by Yuval Noah Harani is Sapiens, Brief History of Humankind. I know this gets very scientific. It talks basically about human history from like the beginning of human history to now, uh, but in a way that's, you know, obviously it's condensed. <laughs> but I thought this would be in a way that would be readable because biology and anthropology and human history in general is something that interests me. 
But as being someone who was not super into science in school and is not super duper into science now, I want someone to kind of distill it for me. <laughs> I want it to be readable, I want it to be interesting, and I don't want it to get too too technical, which I think that's what this book hopefully will do. She's kind of heavy. This is a hardcover. I got it for a dollar. Let's go. The pages are interesting. The pages feel like like encyclopedic. They're like very like like textbook pages, which I find really interesting. Yeah, it literally starts with about 13.5 billion years ago, matter, energy, time, and space came into being in what is known as the Big Bang. Like if we're starting there, we're starting from the beginning. But I think this will be interesting because this is not something I really read often. I want to read more about natural history and get more into it. But again, I need someone to hold my hand. I need someone to be like, honey, remember? Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Let's start you off small and we'll build you up uh, because I don't want anything too technical or too sciencey. Because again, science was not my best subject. <laughs> but yeah, Sapiens. I think this should be interesting. I'm, I'm don't know when I'll pick this up, but I'm, I'm interested and I'm very happy I have it. And the last section of books here are books that I got at the Brown Elephant, which is a thrift store in the Andersonville neighborhood. They always have good books. Uh, they're usually about two dollars, so each of these I got for, for two bucks. I was very happy about it. The first is Prodigal Summer by Barbara Kingsolver. I read the Poisonwood Bible when I was at my summer internship in 2018, and when I tell you I could not put it down. Like I was literally, I had to sit in a dark theater house to like house manage, and I was literally in the back like with a like with no light, just reading by like the light of the stage, like reading the Poisonwood Bible because I was so into it. But then I have not read any Barbara Kingsolver since. Like I read that and that was it. And so I'm like, I need to, I need to read more. I need more of her. So I found this one, it's two bucks, hardcover. There's the queen herself. I know this is about different families and different interweaving stories of these families in Appalachia. That's pretty much all I know about it. Oh, the pages. I'm just realizing those are so beautiful. I really am interested in that. I like when it's kind of interweaving stories. I like when you're like, okay, we've moved on to a new character and I don't know how this relates yet. And then you see how they all intertwine later. I always really like that. So also I just think this is a gorgeous cover. I'm just, I'm really interested in this book. So I'm happy I got it. Then I got The Possessed, Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them by Elif Batuman. Batuman. I am really fascinated by this. This author is known for very aesthetic covers, either or and the idiot. The, the very like aesthetic TikTok covers and people I think really like these books. Basically this author studied Russian literature at school. I believe she went to Harvard and was studying Russian literature. And from what I know about this book, this book is like a memoir of her studying these classics. So, and what I've read, people are like the title with adventures with Russian books and the people who read them seems a little misleading because it seems like it would be a little bit more impersonal and it's just talking about like like a glo like the societal fascination with Russian literature when it's really actually more of a memoir. Like it's about her journey with studying Russian lit. But as someone who loves Russian lit, I'm like, I want to read that. Also, it shares a title with a Dostoyevsky novel, which is fantastic. Like if you know, you know. Also like, I forget this cartoonist's name, but I always like their, their art style. So that's all in here. If you're going to read just one book about conference planning, Isaac Babel, Leo Tolstoy, Boys Leg Contest, Giant Apes, Uzbek Poetry, The Life of the Mind, and Resignation of the Soul, Seek No Farther, this is the book for you. Cool. <laughs> I knew half of those things in that list. I don't know. I just think it's really cool. And it was $2 and I never see this book anywhere else. I've not read any of her other stuff. Like this has been the only one that I've been interested in reading. But if I do read this and like it, then I will probably read The Idiot and or either or. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Then I have Makioka Sisters Junichiro Tanizaki. Not me thinking that, uh, that it was a woman who wrote this for the longest time wanting to suggest it for my women's book club and then realizing this is a man that wrote this. <laughs> but I finally got my hands on a copy of it. I can't say it's my favorite edition that I've seen of this book, but I'm not someone who's super duper picky, especially when it is two dollars. In Osaka in the years immediately following World War II, four arist aristocratic women try to preserve a way of life that is vanishing. 
As told by Junichiro Tanizaki, the story of the Makioka sisters forms what is arguably the greatest Japanese novel of the 20th century, a poignant yet unsparing portrait of a family and an entire society sliding into the abyss of modernity. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. I know this is a Japanese classic. I know people love this book. I know that this is like considered like a standard of Japanese literature. So when I saw it at there, I was like, hey, this has been on my list. And she's two dollars. So I'm okay. gone. I, can't, I must pick it up. So I'm happy to pick this up. I'm happy to have it. Uh, maybe I have a couple books on my radar for Japanese lit. I know I have that Murakami book that I just picked up. Uh, so I, I don't know if this is like the next Japanese lit that I'll pick up, but it's certainly like I'm very interested in getting to this. So, Makioka Sisters. The last book that I picked up is actually one that I've already read, but I read it so long ago that I actually think I need to reread it. Like this is one I really should reread. And I just wanted to have a copy of it in my home. It's The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank. Not to toot my own horn, but I was uh, one of those gifted children that was in an accelerated English program, um, which means I have a lot of unchecked anxiety now, fun fact. But when I was in this like uh, enrichment program for English, we did a whole section on reading memoirs, which is maybe what kicked me off into, into reading memoirs now. But I picked Diary of a Young Girl to read. When you read this when you're 10, 11. It does things. It does things to your brain. I read this and was so terrified. Like the concept of this to me was so, so scary <laughs> that she was in this tiny little annex, couldn't leave, was afraid that Nazis were gonna come in every day. Like that to me was the most terrifying thing I'd ever heard. And I remember also just being so sad. Like I remember being like very affected by this book and so sad, especially when I found out that she unfortunately this was published posthumously, she didn't live, that just absolutely killed me. So much so that like, did I get a lot out of the book other than being terrified and being saddened? I don't know. And I think now that I am obviously an adult, I'm a mature reader, I think I'm much more prepared to read this now. I think I might have been just a touch young. <laughs> Even though I was an advanced reader, I think the content was so much for me at that age that I think I now could read it maybe grow to appreciate it more. I am lucky enough I've been to uh, Amsterdam and I've visited the house and I remember like again those feelings coming up because I was like I'm in this room like I, I am like in this space where she lived and I get to really like picture it and see it and damn it was a small space like it, really her writing of it was accurate but it didn't even truly get how tiny of a space that she lived in for so long. And I have just been thinking about that and I've been like thinking about visiting that space and, and pondering it. And then I saw this at Brown Elephant and I was like, you know what? Like, let me just get it. Like, let me just like have this, I want to at least have this book because I think it's so important. And I want to read it again now that I'm a little bit older. I think it's, I think it's a good one to, to get to. So, Diary of a Young Girl. That's, the last one I picked up. Now, now let me attempt to pick these up. The Sapiens book is so heavy. Oh, Barbara, you're so big. <laughs> this is my book call. Um, am I insane? Yes. Yes, I'm insane. But again, can't say I broke the bank on this. I'm just running out of room is the only problem. And again, there's books I have to unhaul. There's stuff that I really need to go through and try to get rid of. Um, but you can't stop me. You can't stop me. I am going to continue to buy books and whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Well, that'll be it for me. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me for this kind of chaotic book haul. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know below if you've picked up any recent books. If there's any books that I've picked up from here that you've read and you can advocate for, please let me know. Please make the case to pick up some of these books earlier because otherwise they're going to sit for a bit while I get to all the other ones that I haven't gotten to yet. So, if you've read any of these and you think I should really get to them, please let me know because I will I will prioritize it for you. But yeah, like, comment, subscribe, do what you need to do, and I will see you at the next one. Bye! Happy Pride! <laughs>